Hello everybody, it's Pastor Tom welcome you to another study in the Word. How beautiful a day it is. I hope you're doing well. hope that you're excited about the things of God. I know that I am, and uh, I appreciate you joining me. Taking the time to join us. That's what's so great about YouTube and these type of things, because even if you have a live service and you put it on YouTube or uh, Facebook Live and the things that we utilize, you can always watch it later. And that's what I like about this. You can watch some of it, and then you can hold it, and, and you come back and watch some of it later if you have to. But we just welcome you. And we are talking about, this is our second session in the kingdom of God being on the inside of us. We talked about stress, how important that is, because God wants to get his kingdom not only into people, but then out from his people to influence others into the kingdom. Now, how does that happen? We talked about this last session and the, fir the first way he did it, he began to do it, was through <clears throat> this thing called other tongues as he baptized his people in other tongues. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 1 and we'll see this. Speaking in tongues is not gibberish. Uh, I see people on Facebook and stuff, and, and, and I see people on YouTube, and they, they, they make little remarks on my YouTube videos. Really, I don't even let people see most of that. Uh, they'll, they'll say something like, you know, that other tongue stuff is gibberish or it's of the devil or something like that. Truth of the matter is, other tongues is not gibberish. Other tongues is a language that God gives his people when they ask him, okay? And they step out and they start praying that way. That can change the world. I saw a, a, a show the other day about a man that went to heaven. And uh, Jesus was talking to him about certain principles. One of them was other tongues. And in this uh, particular uh, vision that he had with Jesus, Jesus took him to a high mountain up in New Mexico uh, that he recognized as the man was a pilot. And he said, look over here like this. And he saw, you know, this, uh, this plane out here. Uh, nothing out there. He says, now I want you to pray in tongues. So the man started praying in tongues, and he said, now watch down here what happens. And it was like, uh, if you've ever seen an atomic bomb explosion, it was like that. Atomic bomb explosion went off, and, and, and from, from that atomic bomb explosion, it looked like, you know, not, uh, st uh, wind came out of that and started knocking stuff all over the place. And he was making the point to this man. He said, when you pray in tongues, that's what happens. He says, if I could get my people to understand that and begin to pray all over the world in, in their prayer languages as much as I would like them to do that, then he said, this is what would begin to happen. All kinds of stuff would be dealt with. There would be revival that would break out on planet Earth. Folks, this is so vital. People ask me all the time, how can I be used by God? Pastor Tom, I witness. That's good. Pastor Tom, I go to church. That's good. Pastor Tom, I tithe. I give offerings. That's good. How? But, but what's the practical way I could get involved daily? And I, I tell them all the time, go pray. Go pray in the Spirit. You're doing more that way than... <laughs> than you'll ever, ever get with your mind. Because I'm not going to be able to do anything in the natural without prayer behind it. When we're doing crusades, as an example, on Skype, if somebody's not praying, nothing's going to happen. But the more people that pray, the more God is able to then use those prayers and answer those prayers by establishing his kingdom. Amen. Now, in Acts chapter 2, we read it. We're going to read it again. The God started the church... In John chapter 20, when he blew on his disciples, his first 12 disciples, or the disciples that were there, excuse me, he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. They got born again. You get born again, the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you. But you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues so you can be empowered for service. You can have the gifts of the Spirit that opens the door for the gifts of the Spirit to begin to manifest in you. And have your prayer language empower you so that you can be a useful citizen, fully used in the kingdom of God. Now, it doesn't make you any better than somebody that is not baptized in the Holy Ghost. We're all God's kids if we're born again. But what it does give you the advantage of being able to be used by God. You're obeying God. It's always good to obey God. And to be used by God in a way that other people who are not filled with the Spirit cannot be used by God. And so I... I desire that intimate fellowship with God. I desired that. And I wasn't getting that. And this is the thing that brought me into that. 
You see, there's a million reasons, and we'll, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but right now let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and see what happened to the first church, the Jewish church. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a ru rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Now, all of them spoke with tongues. Okay? And there's a reason that the Bible records all of them speaking with tongues, because God wants all of his people to speak with tongues. So those that are there, everybody was there, got it. They begin to speak with other tongues, which means to me that that was the beginning point, but it didn't stop there. In other words, once you receive the initial sign of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you start praying in tongues or speaking in tongues, then you need to do it consistently, all right? Look down at uh, uh, Acts chapter 2 here. I'm gonna, <clears throat> me, let me get the scripture here for you. In Acts chapter 2, because after Peter was uh, got up and preached uh, these message to these people and everything, um, he says something. Down here in verse 37, let's just start at verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent, turn, up, change your mind, right? Turn around, start following Jesus instead of the world and devil and everything else. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So immediately after... He gets up, they have this experience, 120 are praying in tongues. He preaches a message. Immediately he comes back to this. You see that? The first sermon. For the, for the promise is to you and to your children. Interesting, isn't it? So the promise of the Holy Ghost is not just to the apostles there. The promise is to you, to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call. Now let me ask you a question. These guys all got it the same way. They all got it the same way. All right? And so if they all got it the same way, then that's, they knew that's what it meant. And so they said, now this promise is not just to us. It's to you. Then it's to your children. And your children's children, as many as the Lord shall call. Who does that leave out? Who listening to me does that leave out? Yet so many people will try to, they, they come up with some kind of doctrine to do away with that. Anything but believe what the Word of God says here. It's amazing to me how the enemy has come up with so many ideas that are unscriptural against this and caught people up in it. And it's just religious traditions. I've had people who have, uh, <laughs> have been taught their whole lives that tongues was of the devil or tongues was was not real, or it's just gibberish, or, or passed away. And from every kind of denominational background you can, you can think of that have come into my meetings and heard the Word of God like I'm giving it to you now, that have, in, in just a few minutes, changed their mind about it, received, and now are praying in tongues. And they're, they'll come up to you later, a couple years later, and they'll say, I... I don't, how did I go for, this is how they, how did I go for 20 years believing that nonsense? Because they realize how important this has become in their lives. Amen. All right. So first of all, the Jewish church, that's all there was at that particular time, all received it the same way. Well, then we look, if you look at Acts chapter 8, this is always fun. Acts chapter 8, we're going to see. Jesus told them, you go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Remember that? So we get to the part where they begin to minister down here in Samaria. Now, Samaria was a place where a lot of the Jewish people had settled with heathen people that God had told them, you're not supposed to settle with. Okay? And they, these people worshipped idols. They were occultists. They were into all kinds of demonic stuff. 
And so you had uh, Jewish traditions mixed with heathen traditions. This is the area where some of the greatest occultic teachings came out of. We even have them today, you know, this Kabbalah and all these type of things. A lot of this stuff originated in places like Samaria where there was a mixture of Jewish traditions and uh, pagan and, and occultic and demonic traditions all mixed together to come up with all kinds of weird stuff. And it's the same, it was the same way in the early church with the Catholic Church. Mixing, that's how the Catholic Church really began. The mixing of the, of, of the pagan religions with, the, uh, with Christianity, you know. Replacing uh, these uh, pagan deities like, uh, you know, uh, uh, like saints with, uh, the, that were saints, they were called, uh, you know, they were spirits that these people worshipped, they were, they were uh, gods that these people worshipped and said, well, this is St. Joseph or whatever it is. And that's how that all came to pass. It was the same way here. So the church goes down there, and, 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 and uh, the guy that was sent down there, or the guy that went down there, his name was Philip. He's an evangelist. Now, let's go to verse 5 and see what happens here. It's pretty exciting. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Now, so he preached Jesus Christ, and what happened when he preached Christ to them? And multitudes were with one accord heeding the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So it was important in, for the early church to have that miracle working power. Why? Well, because down there in these occult, we're going to find out here, in this occultic atmosphere, this supernatural stuff and false signs and wonders was legendary and actually happened all the time. So when you carry the gospel... You better have the miraculous power of God working, or nobody's going to listen to you. <laughs> if you can go down to the witch doctor and get more than you can from the preacher, you're, you know, you got problems. And this is the case in a lot of places today. You know, I mean, um, it's, it's sad, but if we're not filled with the Holy Ghost, we don't have that power from on high. Well, Philip had it. He starts, you know, miracles are happening. All right, verse 7, some of the miracles were for unclean spirits. Crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed. Wow, not a few, many. Now, these people got possessed by these evil spirits because they were fooling around with stuff they shouldn't have been fooling around with. The occult is the number one way that people get oppressed and get uh, demonized. And, you get, and, and here, Christ is preached, and these evil spirits start screaming and coming out of them. Isn't that amazing? And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Not a few, many of them. And there was great joy in the city. So they had they had demons coming out of people. They had the signs and wonders of, of these paralyzed people and people that were on, uh, back then they would have been brought in on cots and stuff and they just got up and walked off. Wow. Woo, glory to God. And great joy. People just had joy. Laughter broke out and people were having great, great manifestations of joy. That sounds like quite a good meeting to me. The very type of meeting, meetings and stuff sometimes we have, me and my wife have like this, are the ones that get criticized the most by some Christians in the church. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Well, anyway, verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously okay, practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. Now, in history of the occult world, this man was famous. This man was a famous sorcerer who, as we're going to find out, he practiced these sorcery here. And this man had a lot of power over these people. And I, I can only tell you the guy was probably very wealthy. Okay? Watch. We'll find out why. He astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. Well, why would they say that if there wasn't some kind of demonstrations of power? But I, by that I mean occultic, faults, signs, and wonders. Now, we don't need to be afraid of occultic. You know, Jesus said something. He said, you know, in the last days you'll see a lot of faults, signs, and wonders. And then people say, uh, you know, there's an evangelist that rolled, 
comes into town or there's somebody like me that comes into town and we have signs and wonders and miracles and great joy breaks out and people you know falling out under the power of God because the power of God's so strong and then, and then they'll say well, you got to watch out for that because you see that's that's what Jesus was talking about was those false signs and wonders well people it's not false signs and wonders when people are getting saved getting filled with the Holy Ghost, getting healed, getting delivered from evil spirits all over the place. That's not false signs and wonders. Those are real signs and wonders. You see, but there are false signs and wonders, and apparently Simon was doing it. They're not hard. It is not hard to tell the difference. Okay? And they heeded him because he, he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. They did what he said. This guy controlled them. Probably controlled their pocketbooks, too. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, there it is again. See, they were preaching the kingdom of God, not just the gospel of salvation. That was the starting point. But things pertaining to the kingdom of God. There's a lot of things pertaining to the kingdom of God that you have to preach. And the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. So these people got saved. These people got saved, and they were baptized with water. See that? Then Simon himself also believed. When he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and was amazed, seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. Now listen to this. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John down them to them, whom when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. You see that? Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. So Philip goes down there, preaches Christ to them. There's great outbreaks of joy. They get delivered. There's miracles. They get baptized in water. And to do that, you have to be a Christian in their mind anyway, right? So they're baptized in the water. So these are believers. And then, so when Jerusalem hears, hey, Samaria down there is receiving the word of God. They send down the apostles. Why? Apparently, to make sure they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. I like that when ministry gifts work together like that. For he had, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, or they'd been saved and baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And uh, then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Interesting the way this works, because I want you to see several things. Number one, we know there's a, uh, two things that happen here. There's salvation when you receive Christ and you're baptized. And then the apostles came for to lay hands on these people and make sure they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. must have been important, huh? And uh, it's very interesting to me, though, you see, when the Holy Spirit came the first time, nobody laid hands on anybody. They just came and it filled all, all 120 of them. Nothing about laying on of hands. Here, though, you see, as, they, as the church steps forward, the apostles ministered this, right? So it can come that way, too, through the laying on of hands, or it can come by praying. It can come by... But the Holy Spirit has been given, see. The Holy Spirit came the first time in the Acts chapter 2. So this has been happening in Acts, in the Jerusalem church, and people were getting saved there, and, the, and, the, and then the apostles would see to it. They made sure God filled with the Holy Ghost. So they did it like this here, same way. So verse 28, now, uh, no, verse 18, now, now notice this. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that on anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, this guy's heart's all goofed up, but I don't want you to I don't want you to pay attention to that so much. What did he see? You see, somebody says to me, Well, look, it doesn't say anything. Sure, there's another experience here, Pastor Tom, but it doesn't say anything about other tongues here. And I always say, oh, yes, it does. And they always say, no, it doesn't. I always say, oh, yes, it does. And they always say, no, it doesn't. And the first thing I say to them is, well, how do you, how do, how do you, how did Simon know? How does Simon know? You can't see the Holy Spirit. Something had been happening when, when they laid hands on him, right? That makes sense. Sure. See, 
Look at verse 18 again. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, to whom I ever laid my hands on might receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said to him, Your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Now look at verse 21. This is very important. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Well, Pastor Tom, I don't see any tongues in that. I do. Get your concordance out. Just, just stop this. If, if you have any questions about it, you don't believe me, just stop the, the, the video. Go over here to, uh, to the word matter here in verse uh, uh, 21. Find that, look that word up. You know what that word matter means? It's used many times in the New Testament as utterance. Could have been translated utterance. Matter of utterance. And really, it shouldn't be translated yet. Let's read it like that. You have neither part nor portion in this matter of utterance. In other words, they were laying hands on them. They were speaking in tongues. We also know through church history that they spoke in tongues there. So it happened the same way. The only difference was that the tongues, the speaking in tongues part, came after hands were laid upon them in this particular session or uh, particular um, part of, of this when Samaritans, half-Jews, the half Jews recede. So that was there. Now, let's go over here to Acts chapter 10. And we'll find out what happened when the Gentile church first started. Now, remember, Peter had this vision, you know. And, you know, he saw the, the, the sheep come down with all the animals that were unclean. And, and the Lord said, kill and eat. And he said, I've never anything unclean. I'm a good Jewish boy. And anyway... The law, to me, a long story short, God showed him that whom God is calling clean, he can't call unclean. Go preach to the Gentiles. And so Peter did this. And, uh, and we'll pick it up in verse 44. Because Peter gets up in this opportunity and he's preaching to a bunch of Gentile heathens. See, the Jews got it. The half-Jews got it. Now the Gentile church starts. Verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, in other words, he hadn't gotten done with his sermon yet, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. <laughs> they didn't give an altar call, just... <clears throat> and those of the circumcision, or the Jewish Christians, amen, who, uh, and those who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with other tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, a lot of people like to argue about baptism. You need to be baptized. If, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. Well, these were. They didn't get baptized till after they had the experience of the Holy Spirit coming on the inside of them. You know the Holy Spirit doesn't go into unclean vessels. Come on, guys, grow up. Church of Christ people, that, that's a big deal to them. Got to be baptized the way we say or just not saved. Well, I got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost long before I ever got baptized in water. I'm not saying that's right. It's just I didn't know any better. And uh, I was still praying in tongues. I still love Jesus. You couldn't convince me I'm not saved because I had that born-again experience as well as thousands of other people. So let's just grow up. Baptism in the water is important. But when it takes place, see here, uh, if, you know, if you can, it's good to get people baptized immediately after they receive the Lord in the water. But sometimes that doesn't work out. But we need to get them baptized in the Holy Spirit because that is vital for them, Okay vital for them to be empowered from on high as soon as possible, right after. I do it in my prayer lines many times uh, if I'm uh, in meetings and, and I have the ability to teach people a little bit, I'll do it immediately with the same altar call I do for, for, for salvation. So I have the people that are had just got saved after we pray stay right there. Then I also have the people out here in the audience that would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and never have come on up, all of them together. I said, now you're all Christians now. These are new ones. You're older. But we're all going to receive the same Holy Spirit. And uh, praise God, it's all, it's all good, right? So I take them through a prayer. I teach them how to release their faith. 
and you know all, all of them get filled with the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter whether they're new Christians or they're old Christians. They can immediately receive it. That's that's how I do it because I want to make sure they get everything they possibly can from God. So here we see the Holy Spirit didn't even wait. No hands were laid on anybody, just fell on them, interrupted Peter's sermon. That's a good way to get your sermon interrupted. Holy Ghost just falls on everybody and they start talking in tongues. So apparently, while he was preaching the word, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Apparently, <laughs> they had been saved while he was preaching. They didn't need an altar call. See, people, you know, a lot of people are funny to me. They try to make up formulas all the time. And I, I see it all the time on Facebook. I, I see it all the time on Facebook. Well, you got, you know, how do you get saved? Well, you have to repent. Well, it says that in one scripture, the, the scripture before this, repent, be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus. Okay, they take that and they say, that's the way you do it. Okay, well, if that's, the only way, if that's the way it worked, how come the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? That'll work. How about Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10? You know, if you believe in your heart that, uh, and, and believe Jesus uh, Christ was risen from the dead, confess him as Lord, you'll be saved. How do you get saved, Pastor Tom? cried out help these people here right in the middle of the sermon cried out somehow they, they, their hearts were right and God was able to give them the Holy Ghost save them, give them with the Holy Ghost they didn't even go through a prayer that I saw you know we, we, we tend to put God in some kind of a box and there's lots of ways he can work it's always the word is always going forth and the Holy Spirit is always doing something but there's so many ways God does it I think that we just need to know that God is God. And if you have a specific way it works for you, I do. A specific prayer or way I take them through that works for you, you do that. Amen. But don't build doctrines that are not true and make people legalistic and, and freak them out saying, I've never done that, so am I really saying you know, confused? A lot of gospel preachers get people more confused than they help them. Amen. Now, that's really great. Go down to Acts chapter 19 here. And let's take a look at something else because uh, I want to make sure that we, we finish this. The Apostle Paul spoke in tongues more than all of them put together, the Bible says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He believed in the benefits of praying in tongues, speaking in tongues, talked a lot about it. In fact, the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 talks more about the gift of the tongues and interpretation than it does any of the other gifts of the Spirit. It goes into great detail about how it's to be administered and stuff. You ever thought about that? And there's reasons for that because it is the gift that should be the most prevalent amongst the church in our age, but in need, for the lot of, a lot of tongues is private devotional tongues. And I'm trying to explain this to you. This is why you need it. Now, in Acts chapter 19, this is on a missionary trip. Paul goes on a missionary trip, and Apollos, right? Verse 1, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. So Paul goes to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, if you went to a foreign land that you'd never been to before, and you found some people that you thought were disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, which would be thrilling, what would be the first thing you ask? Apparently, it was important enough to Paul for the question, first question to be answered. Did you receive the Holy Ghost since you believed? And apparently it's important enough to God to get that over by putting this in the scriptures. Interesting, isn't it? Did you receive the Holy Ghost since you believed? So they said, we have not even heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. We don't know anything about this. And he said to them, unto what were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. And Peter said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after them, that's Christ Jesus. That's how you get saved, you believe. Verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul took them in, explained salvation, they got baptized. They're good. Okay, they're in the kingdom of God. Right? I said, right? Verse 6. When Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke a tongue and prophesied. Men were about 12. Now it's interesting, in this particular uh, scripture they also prophesied but for sure they spoke in tongues now i got to tell you folks i don't know how the bible 
to make this more clear for all of us Christians out here who need to understand why it's so vitally important to, to pray in tongues. Every Christian needs this. First of all, to be able to fellowship the way that God created you with your Heavenly Father through prayer, worship, praise, you got to have other tongues. And to begin to pray out the perfect will of God into the earth, you've got to have tongues. To establish the kingdom of God that is within us, out into, praise God, and for other people and into other people, one of the greatest things we have is other tongues. Well, I've I'm, I'm run out of time. Boy, I sure have enjoyed being with you today. I really pray, I, I just pray, Father in Jesus' name, you'll use these messages. And I, I just pray for you today that you if, you, if you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know, it's very simple. You have to ask God. You say, God, I want this. That's what I did. I said, Lord, I want this. And I saw a scripture in Mark eleven twenty four. 24. It says, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And I said, well, Lord, I believe I received this. I was all by myself in my room. I believe I received my prayer language is what I called it. In Jesus' name. And nothing happened. I did that three times. And I went to the Lord. I know that when things don't work, there's a reason for it. So I went to the Lord. I said, no, Lord, I know it's not. It's got to, I've got to be missing this somewhere. What, what am I doing wrong here? What's up? And the Lord took me back to Acts chapter 2, and I, and I read it again. And they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the ability. And I saw it. Oh, my gosh, i gotta, I got to cooperate with God on this. Not just him, not just me. It's both of us together. i got to open my mouth up and speak. It has to be a first time. <laughs> i got to do it by faith. Right when when the, when the apostles laid hands on them, they were, they were telling them, "You got to open your mouth and speak." They didn't just go receive you the Holy Ghost and nothing. They they made sure they were speaking in tongues. It's very apparent that when they heard the Gentiles, the whole thing was they they heard them speak with tongues, They're, like we did. That's got to be God, and so that's the only way you know. That's the initial sign. That's the empowering of God. That's what God wants, so that you can pray that way, and that's the way I do it. And uh, you know, and so. I, I saw that, and I, and I, I, I went to God again. I, I lifted up my hands. Thank you, Lord. And I just, by faith, I just, okay, me, and I started speaking in tongues. I've been going ever since. And you do the same thing. You just right there. You just say, oh, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, you ask, ask God for it. Just say, Lord, give this to me. It's inside me. I know you want me to have this. Baptize me with your fire. Baptize me with your love. Baptize me with the Holy Ghost. And give me my prayer language, and I'll pray it that way every day for the rest of my life. And you just It's that simple. You say, in the name of Jesus, I receive that. Open your mouth and start praying. And whatever comes out, what, you, know, you don't pray in English. You don't pray in, in, in your own language or another language. You know, whatever comes out, though, you just won't get let me hit you. begin to yield to it. Okay, and just trust God. You know, a lot of people have a hard time trusting God. Well, I don't know if that's real or not. You know, yeah, why would God not give you what he promised? Just calm down. Start praying that way. Keep praying that way. You'll find out that over a period of time praying that way, it'll change. You'll get the, your, 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 the language will get stronger and stronger. You'll go into other languages. The sky's the limit, brother. So just remember that. Now, so... Why don't you take a moment, if you need to, and pray that way. Also, I want you to know that this ministry, tremendously fruitful ministry, we've got 100 people a week coming to Christ right now, averaging. We want to go over that. So we need partners, people to stand with us, that you'll pray. If you'll, if you'll do me a favor and pray for, just say, for a half an hour even, or 15 minutes another time, just say, Pastor Tom, or Lord, I want to pray for Brother Tom and his work for, for a few minutes here. We would really appreciate that. And we appreciate all of you considering supporting us with any amount of money. Some people send lots, some people little. It's, it doesn't matter. It's whatever God says. And if you'll do that, you can go to our website, faithalifefellowship.org. I'd appreciate if you go to faithalifefellowship.org and let us know you're listening. Give us your prayer requests. That's faithalifefellowship.org. On there, there's free seminars. It's all free. You get teaching like this. 
but you can also go ahead and donate and it's all secure and safe and become a partner with us we'd really appreciate it listen I, I love you guys more than words can express and we're always praying for our partners and the people that are watching us if you enjoyed this video please share it that's the way they get around you know is people say hey check this out you know send it on Facebook post it on Facebook or Twitter Twitter or whatever they're using out there and until next time this is Pastor Tom. God bless you. We love you. We're praying for you. Amen.